when I decided to make this film, I wanted to put madness on the screen. See ya! Wouldn't want to be ya! To me, madness is like in a frame, barely contained. And that's what people sometimes want to go and see when they go and see a movie. So this film is, is going to be like a punch in the face. Paul Motor is a well-known actor, director and producer in the Melbourne indie film scene. He played a lead role in the 2003 film Razor Eaters and has appeared in many other Australian films and TV series like Killing Time and Predestination. He even played a key role in James Wan's original Saw short. I just finished my shift at the hospital. I've been making films since I was um, 17 years old and we started off, we grew up in Ocean Grove and this was back before the days when there were such things as video cameras so we had Super 8 movie cameras and we used to get little cartridges of movies, um, about three minute it would last and shoot these little Super 8 films and then put them in for processing and while we were waiting for them to come back over a week we'd get another one. So we ended up making 100 Super 8 films and teaching ourselves how to make films with editing using little splices and viewers. And from that I went on to film school, so I got into Swinburne Film and Television when it was over in Hawthorne and got my degree in film and TV. And then uh, when I left there um, in 1987, basically started working in the industry in all different capacities. For his next project, he's tackling a very dark point in Australian history the Port Arthur Massacre. And most of my art is geared towards doing stuff that's very confrontational, um, outside the box and certainly outside the mainstream. So Razor Eaters was a very uh, tough film, very intelligent, sort of like a cross between Romper Stomper and The Fight Club. And we released it all over the world and we won awards and all that stuff. And I hadn't made a film for quite a while, so I was looking for something comparable to do as my next project. And I initially was going to do a horror film and then Somebody mentioned to me, why don't you do Port Arthur? And I thought, yeah. Um, no one's done anything about that uh, time. And it was 20 years ago. I think it's 22 years now. So I decided, all right, I'll do a, a very tough, hard-hitting biopic of Mark Bryant and um, a depiction of the tragedy. And uh, started to research it. And that's the film that I'll be making in 2019. And I've written a, a very powerful script, very confrontational, very dark. But the deeper I dug into it, the more I said, this just doesn't add up. It's a strange tale. Um, a lot of the stuff just doesn't add up. So it became a very convoluted script to write and very um, research heavy. I thought I would have a lot more luck with this film because it's, a, it's an Australian story, it's a major part of our history, um, albeit a very dark part. And I took this film to everybody, the script, um, took it to the American film market in 2016, um, took it to a lot of American companies, some UK companies, and some of the big players here in Australia. And everybody was like, no, no, no leave it alone, we don't want to touch it. There's something about this event that really uh, distresses people, which I understand, but they just don't want to make a movie of it. They want to bury it and forget about it, especially the people of Tasmania. But I decided this was you know, a very important film to make. It fundamentally changed a lot of things in Australia, not the least of which was the gun laws. We are here at Elwood Beach, filming a scene for the trailer of Wasp, the Port Arthur Massacre. Paul is planning to show the trailer to potential investors to raise money to complete the film. The trailer, in essence, is going to be an extended trailer, but it will give you a, um, a sense of the film, as most of them do. And the film we were, the scene we were filming was um, basically Martin Bryant coming out of the cafe and uh, walking into the public area and people scattering and him just uh, stalking along with, with the rifle. And then later on we did some scenes where he was um, basically arrested by the, the SOGs. They just swarmed him and crunched him. Uh, so we shot those scenes, but I need to come back and do uh, some wide shots with, with bigger crowds and so on. Uh, so basically we'll put together some little sequences that will enter that trailer and, and give you a sense of the movie as a whole. I'm a big one for attention to detail. So a lot of it, a lot of the film is, especially because it's set in 1996 when the tragedy occurred, um, everything was different. Vehicles were different, people dressed differently, um, and the police uniforms were different, of course. 
So, uh, you know, doing the, the trailer just independently with my own money, it, it's a bit hard to, to have the resources to do everything like that. But I think we did a pretty good job. So um, research is important and then attention to detail so that it looks, it looks legitimate and it, it has production value. It doesn't just look like some cheap costume you got from a costume store. Finding Martin Bryant was an interesting quandary because he has a very specific look. He has almost like a, a, a surfy look, this kind of long, blonde, beautiful hair, clear skin, young looking, but at the time of the massacre, he was actually 29. But you need someone that looks like that and can also act. And the character is very complex. On the one hand, there's a sort of a naivety and uh, a sense that he was, in essence, um, uh, of poor intellect because he was he was uh, diagnosed as having a 66 IQ and he had this kind of girlish giggle and sort of almost childlike mannerisms but the, there's another side to him which is quite cold and calculating and clever. My research has pointed out that there um, there were some indications that there were sort of like two Mark Bryants one was a little bit more cluey than people thought. I found an actor for the trailer who, who was really good for the main film, you want to get certain actors that are going to be right for the part without being recognisably famous. So if I got a name actor to play Martin Bryant, then you'd be distracted by the fact that it's the celebrity. So in some ways I want to cast an unknown um, and someone that will really go there on screen. Very tough role. Paul has come under repeated attack over this film as he has chosen to explore the conspiracy theories behind the event. He even did an interview with the project back in 2016. Because there was no open trial, uh, there were never any fingerprints um, taken from the scene that proves that Martin was there. There were never any ballistic evidence matching the firearms to the crime scene or Bryant to the firearms. There's not going to be ballistics evidence because there was a confession. Like that's not going to be presented in front of court because there was a confession. Yeah, yeah. that's... That's my understanding as well. Once somebody pleads guilty, you don't have to provide evidence. Um, and so there's stuff. nothing to be made then of I guess the fact that people that have to understand that this evidence hasn't been presented publicly. Of course it hasn't been presented publicly. That's the way the system works. If there was a defensible case, in this case, it would have run a trial. That's what would have happened. And those discrepancies, if they even exist, would be discussed and judges would rule on them. But the fact that someone can just say, in a case where there was a conviction, uh, and, and really no debate about who did this. Oh, look, there was a discrepancy over here. That's the stuff of conspiracy theory. That, that's how you build a conspiracy theory, is you try to inject doubt where there just isn't any. A lot of people out there don't agree with you who just think, look, there's not enough evidence. There are people there out there... They're in no there, position to say that, Paul. They're in absolutely just saying there's not no enough evidence position to say that he, he was... Well, they can't say that, because it didn't go to trial. We didn't see the evidence because there was a confession. So, like, this is absolutely unremarkable as a legal proceeding from what I can tell. And it sounds when you say, well, there's all this stuff out there that might make it remarkable. That's what leads me to believe there's something really weird going on here. And I can completely understand why survivors and their families would say, no, we don't want this made. Notice how Walida Lee allows Paul to make all of his points about the subject before offering his side of the argument in a polite and respectful manner. Truly one of the greatest interviewers on Australian television. The biggest thing that's come out of this movie is the, is the uh, controversy about the clash between the conspiracy angle and the mainstream story. Going into the interview, I knew what the project was like. I knew what they would do to it, which is they would butcher the interview and make me out to be just a conspiracy nut and the film had no integrity, which they did. They cut a 14 minute interview down to one and a half minutes. Anyone wants to criticize my approach to this movie, go and do the research that I've done and then talk to me. It's all very well to watch all the 60 minute interviews and all that stuff, but I have dug very, very deep, deeper than most. I've spoken to most of the police that were the uh, first responders there, um, the police that guarded him in the hospital, the guy that was the um, negotiator on the phone with him, um, people that grew up with him, his family, a lot of the victims and the survivors who do support the film. Most of them do support me making this film. Some of them don't want to know about it, of course, but there is, all I'll say is there is definitely something here that is not what the mainstream is telling you. There is a lot, a ton of it, that just doesn't add up. Everything from witness statements to factual events that just are in contradiction 
to what we've been told occurred. A lot of the events or anomalies and contradictions, they will, they will basically make people scratch their heads and go, that doesn't make sense. And then I'll have to, they'll have to make uh, their own decisions about what it means because I can't prove anything other than the fact that, or the, you know, the notion that Martin Bryant was the sole shooter. But there is a, anyone who wants to look, there is a ton of information out there that will suggest otherwise. He has also received some very creative death threats from the people of Tasmania. I have people that basically came from Tasmania that were sending me messages saying, oh, listen, I've got an idea for a scene in the film where the filmmaker's down there making the film and someone takes a shot at him from the bush and he's killed before the film. Sort of things like that. Um, a lot of angry people saying, you know, basically I'm a bastard for wanting to do this. I always approach it from the point of view of saying, look, I understand your distress and your anger, but Tasmania doesn't own this tragedy. It punched a hole through the whole of Australia. It affected everybody. And Tasmanian always has always been a very insular, closed community. They don't like to air their dirty laundry. So on the one hand, I understand their distress and their need to just forget about it, but it will not go away for a lot of people because it's a, it's a boil that hasn't been lanced. It's festering. There's too many unanswered questions. One of my good friends is Stephen Howard, who lost his wife in the cafe tragically and he's furious he just thinks the whole thing was a whitewash and he wants to be in the film he wants to play a part mm. in the film and he wants to have his say because he felt like they were cheated they never got their say um, and they were basically shunted to the side and they never got justice so there's a lot of people that are involved that like me think justice was not served Follow the page WASP, the Port Arthur Massacre, for more information and updates. And let us know your thoughts on the conspiracy theories behind the massacre in the comments below. A lot of people, a lot of people just think the mainstream story isn't the main story. And a lot of people are also unaware of a lot of the factors that lead to that understanding of the event. I always say when people ridicule conspiracy theorists, Stephen Hawking has a theory, Carl Sagan has a theory, there's nothing wrong with asking questions. And that's what I did. I just went into this open-minded. Every time I asked questions, more of them cropped up.